too. So, all right, great.
Good morning and welcome. Welcome. Welcome to those of you joining us on Facebook. Welcome to those of you out in the parking lot. Where is Bobby Brown? Come on. Um, welcome to all of you who will be joining us later on in the week and through YouTube. We're so grateful for your presence and it's wonderful to have you here. This week, I will remind you, would normally have been the week that we would have music and worship, but we, we met last week. Um, and I just wanted to remind you all that uh, you're welcome at those meetings. You can come and share your opinion. You can ask me to step out of the meeting. Uh, that, the, the music and worship, that's fine. If you, and, and David, if you want to talk there, that's, that's a place where you can appropriately do that and we are welcome to come. Um, also, I want to remind you next week is First Responders Week. It's all, but we're putting an emphasis this year on those of you who have been in the medical field and who have carried us through a pandemic single-handedly. And so we want to honor and, su and surround you with our prayers in Thanksgiving. So if you, even if you're a retired member of the fire company, or if you uh, have been, if you're retired from nursing or being, whatever it is that you may have done in the healthcare field, even if it's computers or something like that, Mr. Horlocker, uh, you're supposed to, uh, Janine Barnaby, where is Janine Barnaby? Come on. Uh, but where, uh, where you have been involved, no matter how it is that you have helped, we want to honor you next week. So please make some calls and invite some of your friends that you know uh, are involved in those fields so that they can be here. I know we have a lot of nurses in this congregation. And, um, and we have some aides, I'd re we'd really like them to come. Also next week, there will be a um, luncheon, little kind of, we're sharing. There's a sign up, is the, si the sign up is for what, Phyllis? That ham and, this is for, sign up's not for that. Sign up's for ham and cheese, sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, but please come next week and join, it'll be, because in May, the second, usually we gather on the second week of May, but this year um, that means it's Mother's Day. It's, it's always the second week of May. So we're gonna, we'll be meeting on the first uh, Sunday of the month for fellowship next week. So please share that. Um, also, somebody was trying to start the wave up in the balcony this morning. So way to go, Cindy. I, uh, it, I, it was, I know Carol. Of course, Carol. It, but yeah, De now Debbie gets into it. No, no, she wasn't paying attention at the time. We couldn't get it across the balcony. So <laughs> I, I, that felt good, though, to see you all so excited about being here. So thank you. Please, uh, again, reach out to your neighbors during this week. Remind them that they are missed here and that we would love to have them join us. You can just give them a bulletin. Uh, Marty Ritter did that, and we got we got visitors from out of that for on Easter Sunday because he shared a bulletin and just said, "Hey, we love our church, and you're invited to come anytime you would like to." So that was such an easy way to do it. So take your bulletin along and share it with someone else. And now, my friends, I invite you to join with me by worshiping God Almighty. I invite you to rise in body or spirit. My friends, blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who, by whose hand we are given new birth, and by whose speaking we are given new life. Amen. <laughs>
In the laughter of children, we hear the voice of the gate of the way and find our way home. The shepherd of our lives leads us through that door into life with him forever. We are baptized with living waters which refresh us, restoring us to follow Jesus all our lives. The Holy Spirit, keeper of truth, is the light which gives us through every shadow, guides us through every shadowed moment. Let us worship God. Today is sometimes called Good Shepherd Sunday. Jesus is called the gate of the sheep in today's gospel. The risen Christ opens the way to abundant life. He anoints our heads with oil and guides us beside the still waters of our baptism. Each Sunday, he spreads a feast before us amid the world's violence and war. We go forth to be signs of the resurrection and extend God's tender care to all creation. Our lives can get so noisy. Come, calm your spirits, rest your bodies. Listen for the voice of the good shepherd who desires the best for you. Let us pray together saying, God of all the sheep, those who remain close to you and those who stray, those who are always faithful and those who are lost, be with us today. Help us take a look at our lives and our relationships to you. Bring us close, draw us in, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Day by day, God would lead us into places of hope and healing while we continue down all the wrong paths. Let us confess our sins as we draw near to the one who would restore us to wholeness. Join me as we pray together, saying, God, we confess that we can be scared to hear your voice, out of fear for what we may need to let go and follow you. We stray following ways that entice us, and distract us from the knowing you. We substitute pride of possessions for participation in your beloved community. We resist gathering at your table because of who else you invite. Forgive us, we pray. Return us to you and your steadfast love. Lead us in your right paths all our days. Help us trust and abide in you always. Children of God, hear this good news. God's compassionate love transforms all things and makes beauty that is a wonder to behold. You are forgiven and loved. God sees the beauty in you. Thanks be to God.
be seated. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Today's reading is a description of life in the community following Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out on God's people. The new community is sustained in worship and fellowship, shares what they have, and ensures that everyone has enough. The baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Today's psalm is Psalm 23. In scripture, the motif of the shepherd is used to describe God, national rulers, and prophets, not forgetting shepherds themselves, whose reputation, like that of rulers and the prophets, could be checkered. Jesus is the good shepherd, in contrast to others. We read this psalm conscious of how Jesus references this psalm. It is one that was likely to have been written a thousand years earlier by David, who from days spent looking after the family flocks, became as king the shepherd of his people. As David sought to guide the nation, he looked to God to be his guide. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leaves me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Maggie. The gospel lesson today is taken from John 10. Jesus uses an image that's familiar to the people of his day to make a point about spiritual leadership. Those who listen to Jesus are led to abundant life. Listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke. John, I'm sorry, John. According to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Sorry about that. Very truly, Jesus said, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. 
All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that, I may ha that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the good news. Praise you may be seated. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry. You're fine. <laughs> he's 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 tired of sitting, right? <laughs> A lot of us here, we totally understand this. We have been there, done that. So don't worry. Okay. Let's be in the spirit of prayer. O oh God, whose son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns. One God forever and ever. Amen. So there are many times throughout Jesus's ministry when he dealt with important theological issues by using agricultural references and imagery. The region of Galilee where Jesus grew up and where he focused much of his ministry was indeed a rich farming area. Wheat and grapes grew plentifully in that area. There, was, there were many fields and vineyards and the area around the Sea of Galilee itself was conducive to growing figs and dates and pomegranates. And the drier areas around the edges of Galilee supported olive trees and sheep. Many of those, those products found their way into the stories and teachings of Jesus. In today's text, Jesus compares himself to a gatekeeper one whose voice is familiar to the sheep for whom he cares. He calls them by name. And the scripture said that Jesus leads them out. Now, this is not the first time, of course, in the Bible that we find the image of the shepherd used for either God or a leader of God's people. In fact, many of the great leaders of Israel were shepherds themselves. Jacob himself, the father of the 12, twi 12, twibes, sorry, 12 tribes of Israel, was a shepherd. He labored for many, many years under his father-in-law Laban in order to earn the right to marry Laban's daughters, Rachel and Leah. His elder son, his elder sons were tending his sheep when they threw their brother their younger brother, Joseph, into a pit and sold him to slave traders headed to Egypt. Several centuries later, Moses, who was also tending sheep for his father-in-law Jethro, when God appeared to him in a burning bush and called him to lead his people out of their slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. And of course, David. David was also a shepherd. He was watching the flocks of his father, Jesse, when the prophet Samuel came along and anointed him to be king over all of Israel. His feats of killing lions and bears that threatened the sheep prepared him to face, the Goliath, to face Goliath in battle and to ultimately defeat him. His skill at playing the lyre who was cultivated by many hours of practice while tending the sheep. And it endeared him to his predecessor, Saul. And it led David to, con to compose many, many hymns. Among the hymns attributed to David is the 23rd Psalm. This is one of the many times that God is referred to as a shepherd. The prophets frequently speak of God in such terms, often contrasting God as the one shepherd with the many shepherds that have led the flock of Israel astray. In the New Testament, then, 
Luke tells us that the very first people to hear the good news of Jesus' birth were shepherds. Angels appeared to them as they were watching their flocks near Bethlehem and revealed to them the glorious news that the Savior and Messiah had been born that very night. They were the first ones, other than Mary or Joseph, to lay eyes on the child in whom God dwelt in a very unique way. These various imagey, images of shepherds throughout the Bible tend to give us a very positive view of those who tend sheep. There's sort of a romantic aura around them, as though being a shepherd were a very special calling. But even though the people of Jesus' time shared a little bit of that romanticized idea of shepherds, they didn't have very high regard for the people who actually were shepherds at that time. <coughs> Excuse me. One might compare it to how people react today to cowboys. Old westerns starring John Wayne or Clint Eastwood are still very popular. But Many in our modern urban society regard contemporary farmers and ranchers as backwards and uneducated. I can, I can assure you that is not the case. Farmers and ranchers have to be educated, have to be at the top of their game to be able to make a success of that kind of lifestyle. Likewise, in Jesus' time, there was a big difference between the ideal of the shepherd that was associated with the great leaders of the past, like Jacob and Moses and David, and the actual reality of shepherds who lived and worked among them. Sheep were very important as a commodity in biblical times. They not only provided wool for clothes and mutton for food, they also were required for necessary sacrifices in the temple. Ironically, though, the sheep were probably more welcome in the temple than many of the shepherds themselves were. Being a shepherd was a dirty and difficult job. Shepherds had to deal with all the sheep manure, the blood of wounds the sheep might receive, the afterbirth of lambing. They worked long, hard hours, especially during the winter months when the sheep were generally out in the open pastures. But during this time, somebody had to keep an eye on the sheep 24 hours a day. They had to make sure the sheep didn't wander off. They had to ward off attacks by wild animals. Because of the many demands of their jobs, shepherds were simply unable to attend to every detail of the law. Thus, many of their community regarded them as ritually unclean and outside of God's laws. So even though some of the sheep they tended would end up in the temple as sacrifices, the shepherds themselves probably weren't allowed to be there. As a result of the stigma, the profession tended to attract some of the most undesirable sorts of characters because it was very difficult to be both a shepherd and a good Jew. One often had to choose between the two. Those who chose to become shepherds, well, they essentially were saying, turning their backs on the law, rejecting it completely. At least that's how the people felt at that time. And this fact only reinforced the stereotype of shepherds as unruly, immoral, and disreputable people. When Jesus compares himself to a shepherd, I think he has both of those contrasting images, both the prophets before him and the disreputable, immoral, unruly people with him. Because when Jesus compares himself to a shepherd, well, we keep in our minds those images, that idealized version and vision that we muster up whenever we read Psalm 23. It echoes the promises of the prophets that God would be the one true shepherd to lead the people back on the right path. But the details that Jesus provides with all his talk about thieves and robbers, well, 
and the sheep hearing their own voice, these reveal that Jesus is aware of the real work of an average shepherd. He knows and identifies with the concrete down-to-earth reality of common laborers who were generally rejected by society. In Jesus, these two opposing pictures are brought together. Jesus, the good shepherd, affirms that the menial work of the shepherds is indeed a model for the work of God and God's people. He asserts that their position, although low in the eyes of most people, is actually high in the eyes of God. He claims not only the mantle carried by Jacob and Moses, Moses and David, but also proclaims himself to be in solidarity with those people. There are at least three characteristics of Jesus' ministry that are exemplified by his role as a shepherd. First of all, Jesus provides guidance to the sheep. Now, I have almost zero firsthand experience with sheep, but I know they're difficult animals to herd. And if one of them decides to bolt, which they often do for no apparent reason, the rest of the herd will follow often. It requires a steady, patient hand to keep the sheep together and headed in the right direction. In fact, it's really not much of a compliment that the followers of Jesus are, in essence, compared to sheep. Many farmers will tell you that sheep are probably the dumbest of all the domestic livestock. Besides running away for no apparent reason, they are easily lost, they'll fall off of a cliff, they can be really stubborn. Some of you may have seen on Facebook a meme, I love it every time I see it, there's a sheep bouncing down one of England's rural lanes, and it accidentally jumps into a ditch, gets rescued by a farmer, and then hops right back into the ditch. It kind of reminds me of myself. I'm a little bit like a sheep sometimes. Indeed, at times, it seems that the flock is an apt metaphor for the church. We are finite and weak human beings, and we make up the church. We often are running in different directions, losing our way in a confusing word, world and stubbornly resisting the leadership of Jesus, our good shepherd. Jesus says that sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd and that they will follow him over a stranger. He further contends that he knows his sheep and his sheep know him. Sheep follow their shepherd, not because of threats or because of intimidation, but because they have a relationship with a shepherd. Jesus calls us, though, to be more than mindless sheep when we listen to the voice of the shepherd and follow him. We not only go to where he tells us, we also follow his example. Secondly, the shepherd also provides protection to his sheep. Most of the year, a shepherd in Palestine in the time of Jesus would take the sheep out of the pasture during the day and then return them to the sheep pen at night. The gate to the sheep pen was an opening in which a shepherd himself would often sleep, keeping the sheep from wandering out and ensuring that no wild animals or thieves came in. Jesus picks up this imagery when he calls himself the gate or the door, depending on the translation. No one, he says, enters the sheepfold unless Jesus allows them to. Those who attempt to climb over the walls of the pen are thieves or robbers intent on stealing or harming the sheep inside. But Jesus, the gatekeeper, Jesus, the gatekeeper, stands there in the gate protecting his sheep from harm. This, of course, does not need that mean that nothing bad is going to happen if we're really a part of the flock. <clears throat> there are dangers that exist in the pastures and beyond the walls of the pen. Sheep can open themselves up to harm if they do not fo follow the guidance of the shepherd. And even those who do follow the shepherd's leading, well, we can still find ourselves victims of numerous perils. 
but the sheep of Jesus the gatekeeper are constantly under the watchful and protective eye of the one who has already laid down his life on our behalf. The shepherd whom we follow is the one who willingly and voluntarily gave up his life on the cross and then rose again. And no matter what threats we may face, well, we should be able to take them on without fear. After all, our shepherd has already conquered the greatest threat of all, death itself. And finally, the shepherd is responsible for the daily care and feeding of the flock. The shepherd gives guidance and protection to the sheep, not merely to assert his power and authority, but rather for the general well-being of the sheep themselves. The shepherd genuinely cares for and loves the sheep and wants to nurture and nourish them. As Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. In order for the shepherd to be an effective guide and provide adequate protection to the sheep, he must be in regular contact with them. He must be involved in the day-to-day -day care of the flock, feeding them, nursing them back to health, providing them with what they need to grow and thrive. A good shepherd? That's a shepherd who will do these things on an ongoing basis. As members of the flock of the good shepherd, we are offered all these things. But it's so easy for us to refuse or re ignore the daily nurture that is extended to us. We have a tendency to think that we're self-sufficient, that we don't really need the shepherd. And then when things go wrong, we wonder why Jesus isn't protecting us, why we haven't been guided in the right way. But we are assured that the true shepherd will never, ever abandon us. If we are lost, it's because we abandoned the shepherd. If we feed daily through spiritual disciplines, like reading the scripture and praying, then we're strengthened to face whatever difficulties we may encounter. We will still face the difficulties, of course, for even the shepherd cannot keep us from every single harm, but we have been fed and nourished by the shepherd's hand in good times, so then we'll be likely to find it easier to be guarded, guided by the shepherd in hard times as well. In the final analysis, our society is probably not much different than the one in which Jesus lived and taught. We too often encounter contrasting, even contradictory images of Jesus, the shepherd. Very few people in our nation will actually speak openly against Jesus, but the and the vast majority of people still claim to be Christian, yet many think it's naive or unrealistic to live according to the teachings and the examples of Jesus. Those who turn the other cheek are called cowards. Those who practice sexual abstinence outside of marriage are considered prudes. Those who practice simple lifestyles are labeled hippies. Yet all of these things that were taught, yet all of these things were taught and modeled by Jesus himself. The invitation and the challenge before us then, well, it's to be the sheep of the shepherd's flock. Let's seek his guidance. Let's walk in the way of Jesus. Let us accept and recognize the protection that Jesus offers us. Let us allow ourselves to be nourished and fed in his pastures. Let us listen for Jesus' voice to call out to us. And let us not be afraid to admit and to act as though we are the sheep of the shepherd. May it be so. Amen.
United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. You are the shepherd who gathers us in your mighty and loving arms. Help your church to listen for your voice, especially when the voices of sin, idolatry, and oppression threaten to overpower us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. The green pastures, still waters, and dark valleys of this earth all belong to you, O oh God. Sustain your creation with a love that is both mighty and just. Where there is destruction, bring healing. Where there is desolation, bring abundance. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You'll proclaim shepherding love, comfort and protection for all people and all creation. Direct leaders in our own time to learn from your example and instruction. Give them servants' hearts that they generously seek the good of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You journey with us whenever our paths may, wherever our paths may lead. We pray for those feeling overwhelmed by anxiety or depression or suffering in any way, especially those on our prayer list. Hear us, O oh God. You are the sheep gate that gives safety to your beloved flocks, provide protection from, for refugees, victims of domestic violence, those who are imprisoned, and all people who are vulnerable to violence and mistreatment. Hear us, O oh God. You call your sheep by name and lead them through the valley of death. We give you thanks for those who have died and now dwell in your house forever. Be with those who mourn and give them hope in the promise of the resurrection. Hear us, O God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you. Almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. And now hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My friends, we bring what we have. We bring what we have, O oh God. We know that many around us are in need. And while we cannot do everything, we know that you can take what we offer and use it to make a difference. Take our gifts brought with glad and generous hearts and use them for the goodwill of all. You may be seated.
us pray. God of life, you invite us to share life. You offer these gifts of money and pray that they might bring life and hope to those who receive them. Amen. And now the God of all who raised Jesus from the dead bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Go in peace, serve the risen one. Thank you. 